Mike Tobu, Daniel Palmer, reporter with WNC, and um, <coughs> this is Marina Buda, the, the author of Watch, um, which I feel like we just flashed the book to everybody who hasn't seen it yet, or shot it. Um, so Marina, congratulations. Thank you. Um, you grew up in Queens, right? I did, I did. Um, grew up in Queens until I left for college, so, and in fact was born in Jackson Heights, though I don't remember it, but yeah, I was born in Jackson Heights. So you lived here until until college, though, right? Right. So this is interesting because I, now I live in Jackson Heights, and um, what I love is the specificity with which you you know you're you're describing Travers Park and particular stores and restaurants and street corners and whatnot. Um, you you have enough distance in terms of time, I guess, since you left Queens. This was in the 70s, um, All in the Family, it was this iconic show, and uh, you know, Archie Bunker represented sort of, represented sort of the, um, I guess the old crank who's now seeing his world change before him. Um, and flash forward 30, 40 years, Queens, I'm curious, what, is, what do you think Queens, does it symbolize something to you? Yeah, it's really interesting, and also, can I put in a plug for your America in the Age of Anxiety? Because you did this whole like Long Island description in your that, yeah. the United States of Anxiety. Because I think you got exactly what Queens used to be, the Queens that I grew up in, right? Which is, it was, you know, these hunger down neighborhoods, and they were very much ethnically defined in a way, and very segregated. Um, and then sort of Queens exploded into being the borough of 167 languages, thus Ari's troop and so forth. So, you know, to me what's really interesting about the landscape of Queens is I always think of it as sort of the tabula rasa, the, the post-war dream for people. It's, it's kind of where you get your little, your hold on the American dream. It's not quite the suburbs, it's something in between. And it was certainly that when I was growing up, it just didn't have this influx of immigration the way uh, it has now. But even when I was growing up, it was starting to change. You know, I could start, you started to see all of that demographic change starting to gain a hold. What I love doing the book is in some ways I was revisiting the physical landscape of my childhood and also um, that way in which Queens is so flat and big and you can just sort of move between the neighborhoods and the Queens of now, which has this kind of density that is so, this immigrant density that's quite different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny because even if you go abroad, um, Brooklyn has this whole reputation. I mean, you can go to like Paris and there'll be places, coffee shops naming themselves Brooklyn this or whatever it is because it's such an international brand. And Queens, I think, has this other particular, it's funny, like just adjacent boroughs, and yet it means something entirely different. So your process, I'm really curious, you've got these very particular and fleshed out characters. You have Abba, the father, who is, you know, kind of feeling the weight of the world. Um, he's sort of lost his dream, in a sense, of, of an immigrant who came and is now struggling, I guess, just to barely cling to, um, you know, just trying to, to stay on top of things and, and finding that, you know, it's a real struggle. Um, and then you have somebody like a young man like Naeem who is kind of this struggling but savvy kind of a young man who's sort of on the precipice of adulthood, I guess. Um, how did you, I guess, get to these characters and into these worlds of, um, you know, these Muslim communities and this street life that's just kind of jumping off the page. Um, so, you know, for me, there's always this process that's both the external research that I'll do, and then there's just that internal excavation that you do as a novelist as you're sort of giving flesh to your characters. So, um, Ask Me No Questions, which was the prior novel, was about an undocumented Bangladeshi family. And so that was one particular peril, in a sense, that I had created. And I was sort of thinking, well, what's the next beat in the story? And the next beat clearly was surveillance. You know, if one story was about being visible, the other was about being hyper-visible, right, in this post-9-11 world. So I had my big theme, but you know, novels aren't built out of big themes, right? So um, two things happened. One was I had 
this um, dinner conversation with a friend one night, and she told me about a young man who came swaggering into her office. His father, father, father had a little shop on 74th Street, and the kid seemed to be boasting that he was an informant. Of course, he can't completely come out and say that, but he was this interesting mix, she said, between boasting about it, feeling like he'd gone beyond his father. His father was just a neighborhood guy, but he was in the know. He was with the guys in power. And yet he was also feeling trapped by this predicament he put himself in. So for me, that became the nugget. That became, okay, now I have my, now I have the dilemma. Now I have sort of a character who by, partly by his own volition chooses to do this. That's much more interesting to me than just the entrapment, right? And so then the characters and sort of the world and the, um, they all sort of built out of there. The, the other thing I was just really trying to explore was manhood, right? So he has this father who can't be a father figure to him in some way. He has this little brother, and he's trying in some way to be the big brother to him, and yet he's struggling so much. So I was really looking at these male relationships and how, um, how their sense of a manhood in the American dream is, is really fraught in a way. It's interesting what you're saying about um, Naeem's, I guess, acting on his own volition. There's a quote I saw of yours in an interview. You said it's important that your characters not be, quote, victims of circumstance. Um, what do you mean by that? Because, I guess, isn't that what a lot of stories are? Is things happen to people and how they, um, how they have to respond to those things? So there's no doubt that someone like Naeem, I mean, if this happened to a boy of a very different background, I doubt that he would be in this predicament. So like the fact that he is, you know, an immigrant boy, he's a Muslim boy at a very heightened time in New York, and these kinds of manipulations happen, these, this kind of pressuring happens to young men like him, there's no doubt that's like, that's the pressure on him. But, you know, Naeem also is drawn. He's drawn to Taylor. You know, he's drawn to this idea of wanting to find some sense of agency and strength through doing this. And so that's what, that's what interests me. That's sort of the gray area, because if it's purely that he's entrapped or it's purely that he's in a corner, as a novelist, that's not terribly interesting in a way. Um. So Taylor and Sanchez, the two officers, they're not simply, I guess, pressuring him, saying we're going to clear the charges. There's also kind of like they develop these relationships with him. Did you think some of that was, do you think that some of that is genuine or it's purely strategic? Uh, a, a way of, of getting him to um, work for them. So definitely there's like this bad cop, good cop thing going on. And um, you know, going back to the research I did, I mean, I actually did a lot of research talking to people, and I talked to an organization that works, knows a lot about law enforcement and how these things happen, and how people get pressured and kind of you know what they pull on. I wound up interviewing Matt Apuzo, who was the um, AP journalist who broke the story about the NYPD unit that was targeting Muslim community, Muslim American communities in New York City. Like, how do they work? You know, how do they function? Could this happen? You know, we, I like really kind of pressed people to get a sense of how it, how it all worked. Um, so I think both is going on. Um, I don't think you ever really know entirely Taylor's motivations. He, he definitely keeps his cards, you know, close to his vest. He's a very well-trained detective. He knows what he's doing. Um, and yet, I don't think, I, I think Naeem is feeling something between them. He, there is something going on between them. And that's also going on. So it's really both layers are happening at the same time. In terms of, um, I guess, fleshing out the nature of these communities, and you have all these very funny uh, moments about Daisy or South Asian sort of hyper achievement. I think one of the lines I love from the book was quoted where um, the mom who was boasting about how her son 
um, studied so hard for his entrance exam that his hair fell out, and now he's like, but then Nolan will actually boast about some hair. That's so ridiculous. But then again, here he is getting into Carnegie Mellon, so I guess the payoff is there. And, but for him, it's still kind of like, that's not me, for sure. Um, did you, I guess, draw upon, is this something that you kind of feel like you've witnessed as a mom, as you know, a Daisy, uh, you know, person yourself, you know, this kind of like dynamic of achievement and how people are both drawn and repelled by it? Yeah, so I mean, so definitely, um, so I have to say, because I have my two sons in the audience, like I could also draw on being a mother and like pressuring them and not being sure if I'm pressuring too much. Um, you know, I'm trying to be the mellower version, right? <laughs> Um, so, you know, some of it was just, you know, what I felt about this book is that I have two boys and I've observed them and I've watched them and I wanted to pour some of that, some of that insight about what it is to be a young man and be under pressure, right? And be under all this pressure. Um, I think it's pretty easy to be within that South Asian context and sort of the hyper achievement and any kind of immigrant context where it's like, you know, it, it can be extreme as a mother like boasting about her son's hair falling out. And, you know, I remember at one point when I was like doing research for this, I was in a little, um, I don't know, some little hole in the wall. And it was a Bangladeshi, you know, place where you'd get food. And there were all these flyers and they were all about, you know, cramming, studying, getting into the competitive school. You know, and I would just hear these stories, you know, like five days a week, you know, people tutoring and doing this and working for the exams. And so, you know, I'm something of a magpie. I just kind of gather these little bits. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of listen to people and talk and ask them questions and just kind of sort of like you, the way you're reporting. And they'll just rest in the back of my mind. Um, a friend of mine talked about the lady down the hall, Mrs. Das, who ran a tutoring, um, you know, thing down, and the stream of kids that, and she was so harsh with them, you know, and and was you know, short of wrapping their knuckles. Yeah. So I just, you know, I think that just is pretty easy to pick up on atmospherically. But clearly, I wanted to. I feel like, in fact. There's been a lot of representation of the hyperachievers, but what about those boys like Naeem, particularly these kind of New York City kids who get who are lost between, who are kind of they're not actually doing so well. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's so true. I mean, I guess partly because so many of the people who are in the literary um, class, uh, they're representing and they're mixing with people who are themselves upper middle class who have multiple degrees and whatnot. So that's why I do think it's amazing to have access through this work, um, access into these communities, which you know I live in, but don't necessarily understand what's going on behind closed doors and, and with you know with lives like Naeem's. You mentioned Matt Apuza, the uh, the AP um, reporter who helped break the great story and investigative piece about. Um, the NYPD and their surveillance. Uh, what are the kinds of things that you learn from him or from other sort of uh, research about surveillance and in informants that you didn't know before this? Well, the big, the big thing I learned, <laughs> you know, you're a novelist, you, you, know, you, you sort of imagine these scenes, and um, I definitely had the Taylor relationship worked out in my head. I don't know why, that was always very, very clear to me. But little did I know, they never would do anything. Um, but there always had to be two two detectives present. Like that, so that's why sometimes Sanchez he's like skulking around on the edges, and quickly Naive gets it. Like th this is this is the routine. So the detectives would never be one on one. Um, also, once they kind of got deeper into it, they would sort of take him to neighborhoods that he wouldn't be surveilling because they couldn't really be seen together. So it, it, there was a lot of very cautious, the meeting in the cars under the seven, that, that was pretty true to, you know, true to what you hear. And then the other thing that I learned from Matt, which was really, I mean, here's the interesting thing. Matt said, you know, for him, the story of, being, of informants is not particularly interesting. I mean, 
the police use informants all the time. They use it for, especially for drug cases and so forth. So as a reporter, that's not, that wasn't the news. You know, the news was this broad surveillance of Muslim American communities and informants being used in that way. But informant tactics to him, nothing new. Um, but the other thing I learned from him is he said it's a lot like having a freelance job where they just keep you gasping and running and like uh, they give you 200 here, they give you 50 here and you're like always chasing your fee down. So that really got interesting for me, you know, to, to, so I learned that and you know, he told me about what some of these exchanges were like, like when am I getting paid or how am I, what do you want, you know, and, and so it's as if they always keep the informant on edge. And the amazing thing is that the demographics unit, as it's known, the NYPD's former um, demographics unit, which was just, I guess, a euphemism or a, for the unit that basically conducted surveillance across the city, I don't think it turned up a single, I mean, it was zero results over all these years of surveillance, right? Am I right? Yeah, so um, the status is, I mean, the unit has been disbanded, but there is still surveillance, and anybody in the community will talk about it, and it was, you know, all of that, like, the details about deciding not to go to the mosque, that's a really, really common thing that's, that's gone on. Um, but, yes, they did not turn up anything. I mean, there's these jokes about the reports where the detectives seem to be hanging out at the Afghan kebab house and like eating a lot and enjoying themselves. So there would be all these receipts for the kebabs or the pastries and so forth. So it seemed like they were really enjoying themselves a lot, but they weren't really turning up a whole lot. Um, they were, you know, they were everywhere. They were in college campuses, Hunter, Brooklyn College, Queens College, and so forth. Um, one thing that's really interesting is there have been some cases, and recently, in fact, there was one um, at Queens College, but in all cases, there always was an informant and it always was part of a sting operation. I think something like 14 out of the 16 major cases have always involved a sting operation. So the question is, you know, what would have existed if these sting operations and the surveillance hadn't happened. Right, I mean, if you speak to people in the community, they often think that anything that turns up is only the result of entrapment. That it never would have turned up on its own. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time. I just want to make sure that we keep this flowing properly. The lights are so bright in my face. Is that what you're Oh, okay, cool. Um, I actually know a guy who, who when I was watching Naive um, you know, here on stage and reading the book, it reminded me of somebody who I know, who I see every few years or so, and he's um, very active in the Muslim community in New York. Actually, no, I think he's moved to um, himself, but he told me about this friend that he made, you know, somebody who became his best friend, sort of like just kind of miraculously appeared in his life and became um, just a fixture in his life. And for a year or two, any time um, he needed anything or wanted somebody to accompany him, um, even when he didn't want anything, this guy would just kind of turn up and say, hey, what are you doing? You want to go for this event or that game or whatever? Um, and he, they were very close and then suddenly he vanished. Um, and the next time he saw, he saw him, it was during the Herald Square bombing trials. And he realized, oh my god, that guy's an informant. And mm -hmm. And it, it became clear to him that, like, when certain kind of inquiries were made of him, this guy I know, it was all because this guy was just reporting stuff back to, to the cops or whatever. And so, I mean, I guess there's this real sense of, like, not necessarily just about, I mean, there's that whole statement, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, then what do you have to worry about? But this is really about just an issue of trust and fracturing that trust within some otherwise very tightly knit communities, right? I think that's exactly it. I mean, I talk to people who, you know, like students, where there would be something like that. Somebody who kind of joined the Muslim Student Association and is very enthusiastic and is kind of volunteering for everything and just kind of comes out of nowhere. And, you know, as you say, it turns out probably, you know, 
again, that's one of those things that can also drive you crazy. It's like, were they? Weren't they? Are they an informant? So there really was a corrosive, a corrosiveness that was going on. Um, where, and if you think about it with young people too, you know, where it's like, who do you trust? Is this person my friend? Why are they, you know, why are they befriending me? Why are they suddenly so, you know, in my life? And you know, there were a lot of programs where they were trying to sort of alert people, like if suddenly somebody's like very devout and they were never really devout, you know, it could be a sign that they're actually an informant. But it's kind of crazy making. It's very crazy making. And I think um, for kids who are trying to sort it out as it is and find their way, this only adds yet another corrosive pressure on their identities. The, the title of the book, um, Watched, I, it has an obvious first meaning about being surveilled, I suppose. But for you, you, um, you kind of teased out in different ways. There's different kinds of watched and watching, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's true. I mean, obviously, there's the surveillance, the actual surveillance. But Na Naeem also feels very watched by his own community, right? And judged. There's all this kind of judgy stuff going on. Um, so he's very much, you know, watched by those he loves or those who, you know, those who kind of get on his nerves because they're judging him when he walks down 74th Street and so forth. So I think, yeah, I think there's different kinds of watching going on yeah. in the novel. I know people who have um, who've come to Jackson High and South Asians who are like, I could never, ever live there. <laughs> and that's because of all this watching. Even like random strangers on the street, they're like, you know what? She looks like an auntie, he looks like an uncle. There's no way I could not feel judged. This is what I'm like getting away from. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Um, and I think that might be changing to some extent, in part probably because at least with um, at least with Indians, for instance, like the middle class and the working middle class that settled there in the 70s and 80s, many of them um, have moved on. Like Jackson Heights is no longer the iconic um, Indian enclave that it was 20 years ago. I remember when I moved there a years ago, and I told some relatives, um, and they're like. I live there. I was like, wait, I think you'd be like happy. Don't you live there? No, no, we're all moving out. We're living in Jersey and we're going to Long Island. Because that's where the middle class wants to be. That, that's the aspiration. Yeah, you were going backwards. That's what right. You think you could do it. Right, exactly. Um, I think that we should kind of bring up some other people onto the stage so we can continue the conversation. Hi, I'm Anisha Shiva. Rajesh Bose. Hi, I'm Omar Mascani. Hi, I'm Nathan Daurami. You know who I am, where you live. I'm Kevin Silox. J. Stephen Bradley. Hi, Federal Hanin, and I love Theater 167. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ari Laura Cream. You know, I'm going to go give the first uh, word to uh, Imam Kevin Dawood Amin. Um, he's with the Masjid Al Wadud here in, um, right here in town, right? Why don't you go ahead and just give us a sense? You've read the book. You, uh, what does it feel like to see this experience, which is so central to the Muslim American experience, um, I guess, rendered uh, in these ways? Well, this is a very um, rich subject. Um, and I'd like to quote one of my things. Right? <coughs> it's um, deja vu all over again. Because there's a lot of parallels with, um, from the 60s with the African American experience with the surveillance. Um, it's kind of different looking at the actual interaction between the people who are being um, targeted and also the law enforcement. Um, you can't cover everything in the book, but I really, I mean, the thing I really like to focus on is the fact that not the agents who are coming and talking to the um, informants, but the people who are giving them the objectives and telling them what they want to find out their superiors. Um, the other thing that I really thought about is that this is definitely a problem because all of the ethnic um, parts of the community, whether they be Arab, um, Bangladeshi or South Asian, uh, Pakistani, Indian, they all have a vulnerability. And um, I, think you, I think your research you might have found that this, um, this whole problem started after 
and Queens used to be have like doubled than the South Asian population has now. And almost half of these people were deported after 9-11. So you have that first wave. Then you have the second wave for subsequent um, terrorist actions where there will be a, um, a crackdown. So I see a lot of that. I see a lot of it um, in the community of Patterson, which has a big Arab and um, Turkish community, where you have these same vulnerabilities you hear. And I myself know a lot of people being approached, saying, well, um, you've got your uncle coming over here, his applications with the, um, uh, the uh, immigration authorities. We can make that easy for you if you do this. Or an imam said, or well, somebody feels guilty, someone goes to the imam and says, well, I got approached by the police to surveil you. And the imam said, don't worry about it, you're the fifth person who's came to me. <laughs> so um, the book is very important, and I really appreciate your effort on it and the research you did on it. But um, maybe in a future project, you can look at what are the objectives of the people, or who are the superiors, what they're doing, and how they're manipulating. Um, I'd like to hear from a couple of performers right now. Uh, uh, perhaps Naeem and, um, well, both the characters of the son and father, I think. I'd like to hear um, what you saw in the script and what you were trying to, I guess, respond to and, uh, and project. Um, so let me make sure I get it. It's um, Omar and uh, Rajesh, if you can take the mic and give your thoughts. Um, well, yeah, well, I guess, I mean, for me, when I read it, I related in many ways. Um, I grew up, my, my father was Muslim, and my mom was Catholic, and I've sort of been raised in both faith, faiths. Um, and, and it's just something you relate to, even if you're not Muslim, but you sort of look like me or someone, which is, you know, obviously a stereotype because there are Muslims that, you know, look like the Imam, there's Muslims that look like me, there's Muslims that look like all of us, right? Um, it's not, you can't tell in the same way Christians or, you know, whoever. Um, but, yeah, it's that feeling where, where, you know, I've been, you stand on a subway platform in New York and you, uh, you sort of stand next to someone. I had this experience one time where I stood next to someone and they were sort of sitting, and they sort of like, look at you, and then, you know, sort of try to slyly, like, just sort of get up and move. And you're like, did they, did they move because of me? Like, did I, was I, did I trigger that? Standing there? Or did they just move? You know, and it, it's one of those things where you're like, why, why do I have to consider this? And yet you are, you're considering it because you're like, just because of where we are, you know, the climate of things. And it's like a, it's an unfortunate situation, but those are things I sort of think about. I like, you know, um, and and it's and that a lot of that is in here and, and in the book, um, things like that. Um, you know, there's there's a line that we actually uh, cut recently, but it, he talks about how sometimes you're imagining it and other times you're not. The watching and like people having their eyes on you, and it's true. Sometimes it's you're manufacturing it in your head and you're a little paranoid, and sometimes people really are. Um, and so I thought that's something, for me, I related to that, and I think it's the experience of a lot of um, brown, young men, women, uh, everywhere. Um, and so I think that was something that really spoke to me and I felt was <coughs> important to. Um, yeah, I would, I would, um, I would uh, definitely uh, agree with Omar. I mean, anyone who, anybody of, of color, uh, country knows what it is to be profiled, um, whether at an airport or on the subway or, or wherever it is. And I think, frankly, post-election, uh, all of our antennas are heightened. Um, uh, it actually, with Jay Steven, I, I remember uh, soon post-election, I, I took a self-defense class um, because, frankly, that's a sensible thing to do nowadays for people of color. Um, and uh, anyway, I think these, these um, these issues are sort of present in our lives and certainly present in the book. Um, for me personally, I, I'm not a Muslim, uh, I'm a, a Bengali Hindu, but um, I certainly get uh, just profiled as, as being, you know, a brown man with, with color, and, you know, with a, 
believe it. <laughs> yeah, um, it, uh, I certainly get profiled that way. And uh, we have, it, it's not mentioned in, in our, our reading so much, but in, in the book, there are hints of, um, this is really beyond the scope of what we're talking about, but there are hints slightly in the, in the play of um, what, what the father escaped to get here. And it's a subject that very few people, I think, in the US really know about, but there was a genocide in Bangladesh. And, um, and what he's referring to is that. And he has a line about, about this. And it's, um, you know, I said this in one of the talk backs. I mean, of course, of course, any atrocity in the world horrifies us, but um, an atrocity that affects our own people um, impacts all that, all, all the much, all the more. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of hinted at in the book in a way that makes it clear how awful it was without actually spelling it out. Um, in, a, in a way, it makes it even more, more compelling. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, um, that's what the, the book read for me. I'd like to ask um, the two cops here um, to answer the question Marina and I were discussing a few minutes ago about uh, their relationship with Naeem. Um, Kevis and uh, Stephen, did you, um, were your motivations purely tactical and uh, selfish in terms of extracting information, or was there something more, was there anything genuine in the interaction? <laughs> uh, well, in in acting the role, I have to give myself the most complex and human um, uh, set of circumstances that I can. Um, it is tactical. It is coercive. It is essentially manipulative. That's the job. On the other hand, I actually think that Taylor has a really genuine interest in and concern for Naeem, and on some level really believes that he is doing this kid a favor by giving him an opportunity. Uh, I don't know if that's Marina's intention. I don't know if, if, if that layer is in there for her. It sort of has to be in there for me. Otherwise, I'm just the villain, and I don't think that's interesting for anybody. Uh, so I, I think that, so for me, in acting the role, there is, there is more than just the, uh, than, than just the, the, the extraction of information. But Sanchez. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I haven't read the book as of yet. Um, but with what I read in the text that I had, I felt opposite towards um, Taylor Sanchez probably enjoyed more of the interrogation and more of, of seeing someone suffer. I mean, there is the human quality and there is a part of Sanchez that, you know, is trying to do his job, but he's enjoying doing his job. He's enjoying, uh, you know, torturing or what have you, but yeah. It's kind of interesting. Um, so Sanchez actually comes from, he, he was like a street kid, like Naeem, too. He grew up kind of in the projects, and you know, he, he kind of, he, he, he went into the army. So he comes from like a military background, and he's kind of, he's, he's, he's very armored in a way, you know? And so, and Naeem senses that about him, you know? In, in some ways, he's, he's like seeing these two different kinds of manhood. Um, that he's getting to explore, even as you know, Sanchez sort of scares the heck out of him. But um, that was something that really intrigued me. So having a character who came from, who who may even have a little bit of PTSD, you know, from doing some tours, and so he comes from this really um, kind of hardcore place, and he himself is a survivor. So that was that was part of what I was playing with a little bit. I think Taylor's Taylor's a little different. Um, in terms of background. I have a question for you, Emma. Um, you refer to surveillance 
in the 60s, uh, we know that happened with uh, Dr. King and other uh, African-American leaders. It happened uh, extensively in uh, the Black Panther movement, if I'm right. Um, and it was done very uh, aggressively, almost to destabilize these movements from within. Um, do you think that um, what's, what you see happening in this era with Muslim communities is of a piece with that, or do you think it's, 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 different, it's different in important ways? Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, modify some of your um, prefacing comments. The efforts by the authorities were blanket, and they were driven by uh, J. Edgar Hoover, this is well documented. And it was solely, again, it was based on race. No black person, no black group was to be seen succeeding. So it was more pernicious. Now it's more, from what I can see, the authorities have a push on their particular um, operatives to gain data, to gain, in, uh, to gain information. I've been in a lot of meetings, meeting with um, uh, various um, law enforcement officers trying to build relationships, and that's what they stress. We say, what do you want? They say, we want intelligence. We want actionable intelligence. I also want to just um, make one brief comment on the um, question you talked about the two policemen. <coughs> Um, I can see you're trying to make nuance in your story, but in my humble opinion, in, in the reality, on another case, they'll switch roles, and they'll do equally as well, because this is what they're trained to do. They have objectives, they have a meeting, just like you see in the, the, uh, the television shows, they have a meeting. This is what we're trying to do, A, B, C, D, and E. The people are trained to be able to extract that information or obtain that information. The one has to be the bad cop this day, this one will be the bad cop the next day. So I think maybe they may have some empathy, maybe they may do that, but I'm highly skeptical that the authorities are basically doing their job, which is okay, but I'm saying they're just doing their job. Um, just to, to stay on what you said earlier, you've been interacting with uh, law enforcement, you said. Uh, what else should we know about these kinds of conversations? Uh, you're engaging with them, um, do you think that they are, you said they want information, they want data. What more can you tell us about the nature of the relationship um, and how it's evolved, if at all? Um, it has evolved in a positive way. Um, uh, even, um, I, I don't know this particular audience, but uh, Governor um, Christie has been very, very active with our community, even with the, uh, the thing you're talking about, Manacruz with the AP. He was, I mean, he was very supportive. He couldn't, he only couldn't come, come out too far. But he has a very, very good record amongst our community, believe it or not. Um, in terms of back, in, um, in terms of substance. But I think that um, what's happening is that they're trying to get relationships. But they want, but what they want to do, it really can't be accomplished by going into the Mosque and Islamic centers. The people who are doing these things or have these, they stick out. And in fact, they don't come, they don't come to this long center of masjid because they'll stick out. I will, I will give you one example. Um, I don't know, there were two boys, about maybe 23, 24. One was Hispanic and one was Arab. The, um, the Arab guy had some mental issues. He had been in and out of special ed. And there was another guy he had convinced to be, you know, to take Shahada. I've seen these boys open past. One of the, um, the ones that have been surveilled by Matt Sun's story. And every time they came in, there was a commotion. They just weren't fitting in. They weren't comfortable there. And the next thing you know, I see, I see their faces on the New York Times. So the question becomes, was there any way that anybody could have known that they were going to try to go over to um, Syria through Jordan? If somebody could have said that, then what we do? And I, and I think about that also. We also had an incident here in Montclair. There was a boy who used to live here, and he came back here, and you may recognize the story. I think he had murdered uh, a 19-year-old boy in Livingston, trying to rob him. And he had came to the masjid here in Montclair. And we found out later that some people knew some things, but they didn't say anything. The police came and they, you know, they, you know, um, you know, we have a good relationship with the police. I was out in the country, actually, at the particular time, somebody um, was with them. So really the question is, 
how do we, how do we um, convince the people that the people who are doing these things are not coming any more than you're going to find the, um, you know, anybody from, um, maybe, you know, from another race inside the church or inside the temple. It's not, it's not mutually, it's mutually exclusive. So that's really the problem. And the pressure on the authorities that they have to get, they have to get information so they can justify, you know, that they're trying to do something to stop people from doing things. So that's where we're at. I mean, I don't know if that's clear or not, but. Well, I mean, if I could just follow a little on that. I've, I've seen um, a coverage of certain communities, uh, Muslim communities around the country, who have turned to experts to help them engage with youth um, in a way that is um, kind of prevents any sort of uh, alienated teenager from going down the wrong path. Um, you know, they're sitting on the computer for hours and hours. Obviously, that's happening in every community everywhere in America. But sometimes they may be exposed to the wrong materials, and it can lead, um, you know, uh, to a bad place. Do you think that is uh, something that is a, an actual a problem that is? being discussed in Muslim uh, communities, or is that something that is magnified because it, it sort of like uh, registers a certain way with non-Muslim communities who want to see that you know Muslims are taking this issue on you know, head first or head on? We do have a problem with the youth, and it's something that we are trying to address. There is an issue, and in, in, it's basically called YouTube. You have people on there who are charismatic, and they attract people. Um, and also, too, I have to put some of the blame, maybe 10%, maybe half, or whatever. I have to put some of the blame. We have to put some of the blame on authorities. The people who are sensible, the people who can moderate the youth, they are marginalized. They're made to appear to be radical. They, in almost all instances, the people who who can help in this regard are being are being attacked. And you know, and being that marginal. So what do you have? I mean, what you have is a vacuum. You have a vacuum, and then you have the whole society. Someone who's a who's a 15, 16, 17 year old, 20 year old, and they are, and they have brown skin, and they're told that they're terrorists. They have to be watched out. The immigration policy specifically states anybody from 17 to 35, you look at them, you look at them five times. So they feel that. But I think that the problem basically is that um, the people who know and can moderate, the government really doesn't understand Islam to what they, to they can say, oh, this is a good person. This is a person we should, we should support. There are people who want to make money, so they say certain things that make the government not happy, and then the government puts their faith in them. And that's what's happening. That, that's really the problem. Um. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that was interesting in writing the book is, so as I was writing the book, the headlines were changing. So Boston Bomber had already happened, but then, you know, um, Charlie Hebdo happened, then the second attack happened, then the rise of ISIS happened. So my book began to morph while I was writing it. I had a certain idea, but then I had to in some way take on, especially sort of the online component. Um, so I like went online and looked at a lot of those videos, looked at recruitment, read Al Qaeda, um, you know, recruitment materials to really kind of get a sense of how, you know, a young person could get sucked into that because that that then became part of the story too, which you sort of saw in the, in that last scene that you were in. So you know that was kind of that was um, really something that I felt needed needed to be brought into the story because it, 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 it's a big part of it. The way in which so many are kind of living lives virtually, right? And so you, it, it, it's sort of hard to know what's going on. Um, I want to hear from the <coughs> performers here as well, but Marina, maybe I'll put this to you first. Uh, you've been, uh, aside from this book, you've been putting on performances drawing from this book, um, two very different ways of, I guess, uh, addressing the same sort of story and subject matter. Um, you've also been, outside of this, as was mentioned earlier, working uh, with Mark uh, on, you've published, I guess, or uh, publishing a book on Robert Kappa and on photojournalism. And who is the other person who's working with? Oh, uh, Gerda Tower. Okay, yeah. and who's that? That was his, 
less known, but uh, Robert Kappa had a, I don't know, a partner, girlfriend, lover, um, and they went off to photograph the Spanish Civil War. She was, she was the first woman war photographer, actually, um, and sadly was killed in that year. So she's less known, but she took some incredible photographs, so it's about the two of them. So you just referred to the changing headlines, and now we're in a very particular political climate, which clearly, um, I guess, couldn't have been better time to a book like this and, and uh, the function of a book like, like Watched and performances like this. I'm just wondering if you've, um, since you've been thinking so much through the purpose of art, um, whether it's in you know, wartime and past eras or a moment like this, if you, um, you know, most of us are so we're conditioned to spending hours just reading articles and processing like the crazy making sort of headlines that shift like every like few minutes, I guess. It's a very particular way of engaging in the world. Um, how do you think that art and your art, um, what, is, what is your sense of how art is responding and its function in a moment like this? So I'm going to say a couple of things, and I might even push it to Ari, if that's OK, because I think Ari and I have had a lot of conversations about our motivation in you know, doing these performances. So you're absolutely right. I mean, like, headlines, 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 and this is all very timely. Um, and the connection with what Robert Kappa and Gerda Tara were doing is they were showing the human face of war. This is the first time we had photographs zooming in close on refugees from aerial bombings. Um, you, you saw that human cost to war for the first time through this visual medium. So you entered a different space of understanding. So novels obviously have always done that, right? That is what you hope a novel does, that it, it, it gets you into that space of empathy. It gets you into that. I mean, in some ways, when I think about the depiction of Islam, I just wanted to give it that sort of that rhythmic, ordinary sense in which it was woven or not woven into Naeem and his father's life, right? So, so I just want to kind of take the readers into that, into and open up that space, because headlines and news, while it drives us, it can also flatten us um, and categorize everything. And so that that's what can be opened up in some way. But I'm gonna, I'd love for Ari to. I think one of the most powerful things that art can do is to open us up to another human being's experience and allow us to empathize, to, to walk in someone else's shoes. And I think that that's one of the powerful things that this book does. I think that it's been kind of a gift for all of us working on this project to start to think about how both the story of the book and also people's personal stories are intersect. And I think that one of the beautiful things that the book does is also gives us a jumping off point to have this kind of conversation so that we are identifying with the protagonist who may seem in some way distant. They're, you know, they're a character in a book, they're a character in a play. And then afterward we get to sit down and have someone who just played that role say, yeah, this is my story. And it, it deepens and it, it ripples. Um, I also think we were talking the other day about um, a line in a Theater 167 play that actually is a scene that Jay Stephen wrote that Rajesh translated, that there's one line that I was walking down the street in Jackson Heights and somebody said it in Bengali and I was so excited because I felt like, I understood, I understood these two older men having a conversation and I you know, wanted to go up and speak to them except that all I would have been able to say was that same line back to them and then I would have been. <laughs> But I think that sometimes the process of making art or the process of experiencing art allows you then a window into a culture that can then that can then open. And I think right now a lot of windows are a lot of doors are getting narrower and slamming shut and anything that we can do to invite people through into someone else's experience is very important. Does anyone else want to add to that? I don't know, we haven't heard from Monisha or Fadua. I'm not sure if any of them want to Chime in, you don't have to feel pressure. Chime in. Um, what I thought was really incredible about this was, I'm from Jackson Heights, and 
I I never read a book that is located in Jackson Heights, and I feel like like am I going crazy? Did I forget about any books like you know when I was a kid? Um, and the fact that it it, it focuses on um, surveillance on Muslim communities and you know coming from Jackson Heights, you know. Uh, and being raised by a Muslim father and a Christian mother. My father's Moroccan and my mother's Dominican. And just kind of seeing Naeem and seeing Taslima and seeing Ishtaf, like all of these characters that I know. I know these people from Queens, you know, my high school who are, you know, have straight New York accents. Like they are from Queens, you know what I mean? And they, they're in this book and I felt like, I, wow, someone that looks like me are through the page, you know? So I felt like that was really, really important because being not only a woman of color, but from two, you know, two different races in, in New York, I've always felt that separation from, you know, me going to Queens and traveling into Manhattan, you know? So I, finding my own identity as I've gotten older and understanding how incredible worlds are and because my worlds are, you know, they clash, but they they came, you know, resulted in love, you know, that my parents had for each other. So seeing that and allowing it to be normalized, but then allowing this story to also reflect today and what's happening in, um, especially after you know this whole administration you know i remember calling my my brother and my father and this was the first time that i was just like and you know they there're so many people that look like them you know and in in queens and i i told him i was just like hey john you know i know that you're turning 21 just be careful you know when you go you're going out from the bars like just keep an eye out because i never want you to ever be profiled and he looks like way Arabic than me. Like this guy's, you know, got that beautiful look. And it was the first time I was I was fearful in New York. And so I'm just really, really. Uh, I mean, besides myself, to to be a part of this, I feel like my life's come kind of full circle. And uh, we also did a site specific um, performance in Jackson Heights where we were in the middle. We were like. You know, we were 74th Street, and we were performing these scenes in it, and it was just like, what is happening? My father came, and it was his birthday, and it was just like this weird thing. I'm like, Dad, this story is about Jackson Heights. You know what I mean? Where you you chose to raise us. So, I I I found, you know I'm really proud to be here, and you know, and that Marina Marina wrote this. So thank you, and thank you. Ari. You heard that Spanish thing? I was like, Marina. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, I really enjoyed being part of this and talking about surveillance. And it's so important right now because we also have another level of deportation. And I, I mean, I know recent immigrants, you know, who have green cards, are afraid to go back home because they're afraid they will not be let in. And they have green cards. So, you know, this topic of surveillance, I mean, it's, it, and it always starts with the people who are vulnerable. Then it grows and grows. So, I mean, we need to keep talking about it, making art about it, you know, bringing it all over. So, <laughs> that's my two cents. <laughs> Um, are there any questions for the audience? We can, uh, I think what we're going to do is have, um, some, well, maybe you want to put the lights on? Born and raised in Brooklyn, you know, moved out to Jersey when I got married. Been a teacher of 15 years, the last three has been spent uh, teaching here in this great town. And I accepted this invitation because. Uh, I wanted to hear the discourse that it felt like was about time to have, and it just is not being had because of the Islamophobia or the paranoia. And Marina, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. 
my chest was tight when I watched that scene because your actors are so beautiful and phenomenal. Salam alaikum, my man. And I felt like every one of your faces was replaced with someone that I knew that either I knew was an informant or took away my friends and my family because of the situation they were in. And as a human rights and violations teacher, I find it so imperative to speak about these subjects. Whether it's Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter, whether it's Islamophobia, whether it's the transgender community, whether I think that it's about time to give these communities the voices they deserve. And Marina, you've allowed this outlet. And, and Ari, thank you so much. And everyone at Montclair, thank you for being so, thank you for embracing um, this discourse. Well, there are towns that have yet to acknowledge that this is happening. And thank you for embracing me um, and making me feel like I could be me and not struggle with this American Muslim side, or you know, this American side or the Palestinian Muslim side and how I, I could be both and I could be proud and I could do what I do really well and that is teach. So thank you. I, I humbly thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. Thank you guys. Yes, my real name is really Francis. <laughs> yes, my dad had no idea it was a Catholic saint name, but it was a cool name. So. <laughs> isn't that she, um, that she um, feels like she was shortchanged or that's not expressed in the book. Her stance is that she, she accepts her life and she's lucky to be married. And even though Naeem, her son, is, is not much younger than her or not, she still treats him as a son. So I was wondering, um, Monisha, whether you chose to play, I mean, there was a lot more pain, I think, in your portrayal than I actually have read in the book. So I was wondering about where, where that layer of experience came from. And then I want, I actually want a whole book on that particular character. So that's kind of a request, but. Okay, let's keep the mic up here. Parents for a while, like their parents would go on ahead, 
or maybe there was a remarriage and then they are kind of reunited with this made up new family. And so I knew I wanted to put that into um, that story. Like I, I knew I wanted that dynamic in there because I heard this story over and over and over again from, from many of these, these kids where their, you know, their parents would go on ahead or one parent would go on ahead and then they have to reunite with this person who's sort of a stranger to them. And then let's say you add the layer of a younger stepmother. Um, so the, the, those kinds of things really fascinated me and how they work out a relationship. Um, I'm going to make one tiny little plug, which is actually um, the Watched is being adapted. We hope it will be made into a film, and we talk about it potentially being a series because we'd love to kind of continue opening up this world, like that you have a character like the stepmother or Nor is another one. And so it's it's you know for me it's just the pleasure of thinking that that there's. There's more to be found. The, these characters could keep going beyond the page. Well, you hear, heard it here first. Um, so if that does come to screen, fingers crossed. Um, I guess this, we should wrap it up now. So uh, you know, thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you, Montclair, as Frank said earlier. Thank you to the public library. Thank you to Theater One Six Seven, all the performers, and for Marina and Imam. Uh, thanks for joining us here. Um, I thought it was an amazing conversation. Thank you to Art for allowing us to have these conversations. Um, so I guess, well, thank good you. Night.